good morning, friends. It's such a blessing to see you all in here today. It was always so fun to have our children's choir with us uh, to lead us and open us off. I I love that part of the service. And also, I like that during the sermon series, we've been having uh, these psalms read. Uh, Pastor Jennifer did a great job in these responses. It's kind of like we're getting involved in the Psalms, like we're part of it. And I think the Psalms were written for that reason, for people to find their story within it. So I think it's great. Um, but we're coming to the conclusion of that. Today is, is week five. It's the last of a, a five-week series uh, we're calling Extraordinary, looking at the means of grace, how to live by that. And today, as, uh, as Lauren has already showed us and talked to us about, uh, we are talking about giving and generosity today. And I'm looking forward to it. We're going to look at the passage from um, from. 2 Corinthians, Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church. Uh, We're going to be in chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 6 through 15. And I invite you to hear these words. Listen to how Paul approaches generosity uh, with this Corinthian church. Hear these words. Again, I'm glad you're in worship today. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower... And bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and that through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers, for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. So thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This, my friends, is the word of God for us, the people of God. And together we all say, thanks be to God. Amen. I got to tell you, friends, whether you are a baseball fan or not, (laughs) it is hard not to get behind these Astros. Am I right? Yes. It's okay to clap. It's okay to, like, celebrate. Yes. I, I preached in the sanctuary last week, uh, and at the 815 service, there's the NOAA choir that says that uh, stands for Not Old at Heart. Uh, there, it's the older ch- uh, choir at our church. And when I said, how about the Astros? They were like, whoop, 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 whoop. I was like, whoa, the NOAA choir in the house. Okay, that's cool. I like that. So if they can do that, you can surely clap at the journey. Um, so, I mean, come on. I mean, this team, everyone is, can kind of get behind this team. The love of the city after Harvey has really been embodied by these young athletes who, for the second time in franchise history, has taken them to the World Series. And they are earning history, right? Right in front of our eyes. And with so much that we talk about at the World Series, so many dynamics, one thing that I think gets um, looked over often are some of the levels of superstition that the baseball players have before, during, or after the game. Um, Some call it magic. Others call it just good luck. Some just try to find their mojo before the game. And I understand that. Whatever it is that they want to do, players have particular routines and practices they participate in. ESPN did an article not too long ago that I looked up, and it was fascinating about some of the the small and simple practices to the strange and weird ones that players have. And there's a lot of them, uh, from pregame meals uh, before uh, the game to uh, wearing two different socks every time they play, or um, 
eating this, uh, well, eating uh, the same meal afterwards or adjusting their gloves following uh, each time that they bat. Or some guys even chew the same gum, not the same piece of gum, but the same kind of gum every game for their entire career. Other examples are um, some hygiene decisions, which we're not going to get into here at the journey uh, this early in the morning, uh, or on the field rituals. For example, uh, beloved Astros Hall of Famer Craig Biggio, right? When he'd come up to the plate every time, uh, what was a unique quality about him? His, his helmet, right? It was dusty and dirty. It had all of this pine tar covering his helmet. He came out to the bat. And when he would adjust his helmet, the pine tar goo would get all over his gloves so he could grip the bat better and, and hit well. On the flip side, Yasiel Puig of the LA Dodgers, boo, everyone can say boo, yes, it feels right. Right, he licks his bat. Oh. Oh, uh, when he comes up to the plate, uh, no one understood why he, and you can take that picture, thank you. Uh, no one understood why he did that until an L.A. Dodgers insider uh, asked him about it and tweeted it. And he said in response, um, I, I show my love and affection to the bat while I'm at the plate. And in return, it gives me hits. And all of God's people said, ew, right? Yes, amen, yes. Uh, that's just nasty, y'all. And if that's Puig's understanding of love and affection, then I think he needs a little more Jesus, but that's another conversation. Um, nevertheless, these players, they do these practices, but to them, it's not odd or taboo, but it just simply steps to complete to provide the best outcome for the game. It also is a sport where we all know this, Right? The momentum can shift at any pitch or any swing of the bat. And it helps to create a degree of regularity amidst an ever-changing long season that they play baseball. And I'd like to think that that's sort of a, a metaphor, if you will, for the Christian life. Right? Think about it. We're, we're wrapping up this series called Extraordinary, looking at the, the means of grace that John Wesley speaks of. And I always say that John, the means of grace are, uh, each week, it's a definition of, uh, it's those ordinary practices or channels by which we can experience God's love in our life. And John Wesley was very explicit about some of those practices that we need to do, right? He said, always take communion. That's why we do it every single week here at The Journey, right? Uh, uh, read scripture, uh, find time in your week to create Sabbath, a time of rest, moment. Or as John Robbins talked about last week, acts of mercy and justice, helping out your, your fellow man who is in need of help. You see, by enacting these practices, these uh, means of grace, we are in turn getting a chance to experience the individual blessings of God's love in our lives. And then in return, we embody those blessings and go out into the world and share that love with everyone we meet. It is through these practices, these rituals, that our minds are focused, our heart is open, and our willingness to hear God's voice in our life is at its highest potential. It's what sort of Coach Taylor from the show Friday Night Lights, which talks about high school football here in Texas, always says before the big game, what does he say, right? Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. And then Tim Riggins comes out, Texas forever, baby, right? Um, that's a good show if you haven't seen it. Now, I want to apologize really quick because I know that there are some non-sports fans present with us in the room today who are looking at me and saying, what are you doing right now on stage? Um, and I apologize for that. Uh, as, a, as a child, my pastor always used golf references. Um, as a kid, I think he equated the resurrection more to a hole-in-one than perhaps forgiveness and salvation, which can be a problem. So, but I point all this out. Why I say all this, friends, is to direct you towards one practice that I think is actually taboo to talk about for us in the church. You see, we don't like talking about this because it can, if done in the wrong way, be sort of icky. Kind of get into our personal business. And we don't like people in our personal business. It's the, it's the practice of giving. It's generosity. It's, it's financially how you give to the church, which I know lands differently in everyone's ears here in the room. Like a baseball star with his superstitions, we all hold different beliefs and understandings of the way that our, our, uh, our money should be connected 
to the church. And I know, because I've stressed about it all week, that to talk about money in a post-Harvey space and world that we live in, for some of you, is like unfathomable. Why would he be doing this? Don't forget I had those thoughts too. (laughs) On top of that, the holidays are just around the corner, right? Some of you are thinking, how am I going to get all the food and and prepare that for these families, let alone get ready for gift buying coming in the future? And I recognize that I'm generalizing a lot of this. There are people in this space, some of you who, who didn't lose anything with your house or with your car during the storm. But I called a friend who is a pastor in New Orleans this week and asked him, how do I share wisdom with my congregation about giving? after something like this. He had to do the same in 2005 with Hurricane Katrina. And the one line that stood out for me the most is he said, Michael, no one is unscathed in your community after this storm. And so as we enter into this next season, this next year of ministry, there is a degree of uncertainty. And yet what is not uncertain is how much in Scripture we see evidence of the need to give. In fact, if you were to add up all the times in Scripture that the word belief or prayer or love, like love, right? That's probably a a big one, most likely, in, in Bible. If you put them all together, it wouldn't even compare to the number of times that the imperative to give is present in Scripture. Not that anyone's counting, but 2,152 times in Scripture we talk about giving. Giving is no joke to God. Giving is what we need to do and give of abundance. I mean, think about it. What's the top Scripture probably quoted from the Bible, right? I would go out on a limb and say John 3, 16. And how does that begin, right? For God so loved the world that he, he gave. He gave his only Son. You see, giving is inherent within the character of God. And if God did not first give to us, if God was not a giving God, we would have nothing. And I know that sounds a little cliche, a little Christian bumper sticker E. <laughs> but if, it's, if we actually take a look at its truth there and what it says, I, I think it can kind of put some things in perspective. In essence, giving is God's love in action. And let me make this point very clear. Giving for God is not just about your money. I truly believe that God cares more about your hearts than he does about your bank accounts. Which is to say, I think that's where maybe Paul was coming from when he was writing to this Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was having struggles of of how to deal with this community that was right out in front of them, trying to go out and say, we need to do something with them. And Paul says, whoa, 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 like open your door. You have resources, Corinthians. You are not poor. You're not broke. Give of yourself. Give of your gifts. Give of your time. Give of yourself and bring them in. But Paul says, wait, 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 there is a caveat you need to remember. And he says this in verse 7. Remember this. He says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Paul is saying, don't give out of pressure. That's not what God is all about. Find what works for you. Do you hear that? Find what works for you and make it something that brings you joy every time that you get it. Nobody likes to do something when they are forced or told they have to do it. For me, that comes to mind when I think about horror movies. Now listen, I know it's October. I know Halloween is coming up and approaching fast. I know this is a season we like to buckle up our seatbelts and drive to the theaters and see every scary movie possible. I mean, Netflix and Hulu right now, there's a whole category of classic horror films that we all have an option of watching and then watching the next one and the next one. It can just play on repeat and we don't have to do do anything. But I got to tell you and come out and say something to you all. I don't like those movies. 
and I don't want to pay to go see those movies. Most of y'all already know your pastor's relationship with blood. We are not friends. We are not companions. I don't like blood. And whether it's a zombie or a vampire or our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I do not like a lot of blood in pictures and images. The hymn, there is a fountain filled with a fountain filled with blood brings nightmares to me, y'all. I don't sleep at night when I think about that. But do you know what I do love? Disney's classic Hocus Pocus. And you know what? I don't care who knows it. I love that movie. I can quote almost all of that movie. Leave the pumpkin spice latte at the counter, y'all. I just need a couple hours with this movie, and I am good for the fall and Halloween festivities. Now, if you force me to sit down and watch horror movies and say, get in the Halloween spirit, we're going to have some problems. But give me some time to watch Hocus Pocus, and I am a happy camper. You see, God wants us to be cheerful in what we do, and how we give. Not tempted or swayed by other people's opinions or telling us this is the way you should, you should look at things or, or how you should get in the right mindset. In fact, the Greek word that Paul uses here in, um, for cheerful actually translates to the word hilarious. It's where we get the word hilarious, right? So think for a second. I want you to actually think. When was the last time you had a really good laugh? When was it? Who were you with? Who was around? What were you watching, right? What was going on in that moment? I, re I really do want you to kind of imagine that emotion. Because from that place, God is saying, that's the root in which I want you to give yourself from. God wants us to, to, to enjoy, to celebrate, to think fondly, to be happy when we show generosity towards what God's purpose is for this earth and for us. Paul continues on in his passage, and he begins to talk about what happens when we do give and how abundantly it will be with God. He uses words like multiply and, and enrichment and thanksgiving, and, and he tries to help us understand that, that when we give of ourselves to God, God will will do abundant things. God will help us to flourish. And speaking to crowds of mostly agricultural folks, right, he uses words like seeds and, and sowing and harvest to help really paint the picture. And I think he does a good job at that. But if I can be honest, I kind of found myself a bit lost. See, I don't think Paul was trying to puff up the Corinthians to make them feel good or, or trying to swindle them with a few lines to kind of get underneath them so he could begin to take their money. No. I have found that when I was reading this, that the first thing that came to me is that before I know the results of my giving, I have to first learn or maybe relearn how to give in the first place. This upcoming Tuesday is Halloween. I know many of you probably have your costumes ready to go, your kids are ready to trick or treat, but this day also holds a significance in the life of church history. Because on October 31st, 1517, a German monk by the name of Martin Luther marched towards the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany, and went there and did, as we call it, uh, nailing in the 95 theses to the church doors, declaring defiance against the Pope and against the, the Catholic Church. And although it was meant to really spark some academic conversation, you see, Luther's charisma and the power in that document was the catalyst for a monumental schism within the Roman Catholic Church known as the Protestant Reformation. And this Tuesday marks 500 years since that day. And today, one-eighth of the world's population are Protestants. You and me, right? We're in that, we're in that crew. And it all came from a guy who wanted to reframe the picture that he had always known. One of his many arguments he talked about uh, that was against the Catholic Church was this uh, idea, this Latin idea called sola fide, which means by faith alone. It's the belief that having faith, not doing any works or, 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 or anything you can do, just having faith 
earns you salvation. Now, Methodists have a little bit of a different belief in that. We do believe our faith is important, but our faith in turn propels us out to go and do good things, to do acts of mercy. But the whole point of what Luther has done in this situation, what Luther has done for this, is Luther has shifted the momentum for the 16th century Christian believer. They have now got to reimagine, reorganize, reform, reform the routines and rituals that they had known their entire life. And the Reformation process is a brand new adventure for so many of them who need to see the way they act and live in a whole different light. Does that sound familiar, Houstonians? Seeing the way of life in a whole different light? Which really got me thinking about the way that we give here at the journey. I don't know how you were taught as a child about generosity or, or what practices were instilled as, 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 a, as a young boy or girl growing up. Nor do I guarantee a, a pill or a prescription to give any of you that you can just take and become a better giver. But you see, in this season of the church, as we look to the congregation, to you, for our support in prayers, volunteer opportunities, and in, of course, money, there's a few things I do know. And here's what I do know. And it's that the momentum of the big game, the momentum of a life of a Christian in Houston has shifted. The things that we always knew that we can lean on in times have shifted and changed. Which is why I think that we need a, call it, mini reformation of the way we traditionally give here at the church whether you're a longtime member here in this community or you're just kind of deciding, like, is the journey, like, the right fit for me? The topic of giving no longer has to be taboo if we do it with purpose. And so, first, I think we should all start by finding ways to give regularly. Making generosity a habit rather than an obligation is a simple step forward to begin to shift the way you see and witness God moving in our lives. Second, I think it's important for us to make a plan, right? Maybe it's a challenging one for us. Perhaps it's not contributing all 10% of your income. For some of you, it is, which is is wonderful. Maybe for you, it's saying, I'm going to volunteer at uh, Backpack Blessings every fourth Sunday of the month, or I'm going to say yes anytime those communion folks ask me for at least a whole month to help out serve communion. Or maybe it's to increase your giving by 1%. Some of you are like, 1%? That's nothing, Jarbo. What are you even talking about? I'm telling you, truthfully, that's a commendable step forward. And then maybe in three to six months, you reevaluate and say, ah, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little bit more than 1%. Also, I think it's important for us to pray over our giving and listen to what God is doing in our lives. How many of you have that uh, auto transfer from your bank account there? Do you, do you think about that and pray for that? Or is it just kind of out of sight and out of mind? When you send a text to give, is it just God? When you put it in the, is it just? What if we prayed about our giving the same way we pray about the well-being of our country? The well-being and health of our families? If we prayed that same way, can you imagine what might happen and what might experience within us? And then last but not least, I think we need to enjoy what God is doing in our lives. Friends, we work hard. All of you in this room work hard. We need to enjoy and be thankful that we get to give generously to God. We need to celebrate what God is doing in our lives often and always. So let me close with this. Here's what you need to know about your pastor right here. I know I am not the pastor who will tell you if you tithe 10% of your offering, you will go straight to heaven. I'm not that guy. I know a guy in the city who will tell that to you. I'm not that guy. I'm also not the guy who will tell you that if you give $1,000 to the church, that God will richly bless you with 10,000 more. Again, I'm not that guy. My job as your pastor is not to convince you to give to the church. My job as your pastor 
is to help you continue to fall in love with Jesus Christ. And when you fall in love even deeper and even more, then in return, we can begin to think as a community and to reform the way that we are giving to MDUMC in general. I like how Luther talks about that faith in Reformation when he says in the 95 Thesis, he describes it like this, faith is living Daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that a person could stake their life on it a thousand times. Are you willing to stake your life on it? Because I am. And my hope is for us as a journey that we may, by our faith, by God's grace, in all of the means of grace, propel us to give and not give out of being forced or obligation, but give out of sheer cheer and joy that even in the world that we live in today, even in the Houston that we know as home today, that the practices of generosity for this community will never, ever waver. May it be so. Amen.